Hey there, welcome back to the Teach Them Diligently podcast. I am your host, Leslie Nunnery, and I am so grateful that you've chosen to join me here today. Last week, we started a little mini series on back to homeschool success by looking at how to start your homeschool year off right. We specifically focused in on reflecting on the year that has been, that what has come before. Uh, we looked at setting goals and really aligning those with your vision for your family. And then we talked about a lot of flexibility, um, among other things. But that's kind of the big framework of what we talked about last week. If you missed that episode, I encourage you to check it out. I really believe that it will be a, a help and an encouragement to you. And this one dovetails right on the end of it, as this week, we are going to look at 20-ish uh, tried and true, tested by homeschool veterans, uh, some tips and tricks that are going to make your homeschool year even more successful. Uh, all of these have been um, either my own experience, but a lot of them actually were contributed by 365 members and other um experienced homeschoolers. These are things that have worked really, really well. And I just want to share them with you um, in kind of a quick fashion. But I think that if you if you choose just a few of these to focus on this year and start building into your homeschool, you're going to see an awful lot of um, just improvements in the way that your homeschool is running. These are very practical things that will really set you on great footing, will in infuse a lot of peace and organization into your home, which really, really goes a long way towards making your homeschool successful. So we will be talking about that in just a second. In the meantime, I want to introduce you to um, a group that we have started working with this year. Some of you may have heard them or seen them on site, and that is Tavu. They are a brand new social media site um, that's pretty unique. So uh, I will be right back after this message from Tavu to talk more about the 20 tips for success. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I do want to just kind of echo, um, Tavu is a really interesting resource for our families, um, especially here at the first of the year. Some of you have kids that are getting older. Um, it's a great place where you know that uh, your data is safe. They're not going to be um, confronted with images and other things that... Um, will put them in danger or, you know, expose them to things that you don't want them to see. So um, encourage you to check that out. Uh, take a look at it. Try it for 30 days free with the code TTD and just see what you think of it. Um, I would love to hear your feedback on that too. Um, so jumping into uh, our tips for homeschool success now, uh, the first part of, or the first several tips that I want to give you really all tie together in helping us set the stage for success or laying the groundwork, the foundation for our success. Um, and, and the first tip that I want to give you is, should be no surprise at all coming from me. And that is, as you are going into this year, really think missionally. Think about your vision for your family, what has God actually called you to do, and then start to align how you set up your day with that vision. It actually informs the choices that you make throughout your day. Um, I talked a lot about this in the Heart School mini course. I hope you had a chance to go through that. Um, so, because I really do believe that that is super important content uh, to just help you set the, the groundwork for success this year. But if you know where you're going, you have a vision, a mission for your family, that will tell you how to order your days. That's going to tell you what are the essentials and what are the accessories, as I talked about in that homeschool uh, or that heart school mini course. It's going to inform the choices that you make throughout your day. And that will give you a lot of confidence and a lot of peace as you are making those moment by moment decisions. But if you don't start out with any kind of a vision, with any kind of a mission, any kind of an idea of where you want to get during the school year, everything's going to be kind of um, uncertain. Because if you don't have a destination, it's like, you know, when you're out on a ride and you're just playing the left right game doesn't really matter. You're just going around in circles. And it's fun if you're taking a ride with your kids, just kind of playing around and having a great conversation. But if this is real life, you don't want to just play the left right game. You want to actually have a destination in mind and chart the course to get there. So 
the first tip that I would tell you is to start with that as your first thing. Know your vision for this year. Know how that vision supports the mission that God has given you, and then start making decisions day in and day out that align with that. It will give you so much peace. So that's number one. Number two, I want you to take that vision, that mission, and include your kids in it. Make sure that they know it. Some of our best conversations were with our kids about our family's mission or vision or why we do what we do. All of these things um, bring them in. They make make the kids feel a lot more part of what's going on. But additionally, it gives them the confidence in knowing what kind of decisions you're going to make through the day. So it gives them stability and clarity as well because they understand, okay, our mission as a family is X. This is what we're going for. This is our vision for the year. This is what we hope to accomplish. Here are are the ways that we're going to start moving in that direction. So the things that they ask for, the the things they want to do, they're going to understand because you'll be able to have conversations that tie it all together. And it will make making those day-by-day decisions much easier and much more um your kids will be able to count on it a lot more. So there's a whole lot of stability that comes in for your kids when you approach your your school year and your days that way. Um, So that is, that is number two. One, of course, you know, have your big overall vision mission, talk to your spouse, make sure you guys are on the same page, bring your kids on it. Number two, so that you're all moving together. Everybody is on the same page. It makes a massive, massive, massive difference. And then the third, um, I guess this one's kind of a mini tip in this in this little segment. Um, And that is I would put together um, a lot of people call it a morning basket. Uh, The resources, the things that really feed your morning routine, because as you start your day, that's going to set the the course. It's going to set the um, it's going to set the trajectory of your day. So have that morning time, that morning basket, whatever it is that really helps you set aside so that you can jump right into it. I have talked a lot about the fact that my mornings start with, I get into God's word, I'm praying. As my kids come down, they've always, or uh, they don't all live with me now, but when they did, they would always see me down there having my devotions, David having his devotions. Um, They picked up that habit just by watching us because you're going to reproduce who you are. Remember, we talk about that all the time. You teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. So as you are modeling that for your kids, they're going to naturally pick it up. Um, So I would always have my devotion stuff, my Bible, my journal, any resources that I was working with set where I have my devotion so that I could come down, grab my cup of coffee, go sit down in my devotions chair and start right into my morning routine. That was a huge help to me because it started my day off with a high level of organization and, and, um, structure, which then overflowed into the rest of my day. So whatever resources are needed for you to start your day the way that you want to, set them aside, get that ready um, so that you're able to get up and get rolling. Um, and that that those three things will really, really help you set the stage for success this year. It's going to go a long way in creating an atmosphere in your home that is going to make it very conducive for a successful homeschool year. Um, the second kind of big grouping of, of tips that I wanted to give you is to organize your homeschooling space. Um, really, I, I want you to start thinking about ways to make your environment work for you. Nobody here, there's probably somebody here. There are people who have a perfect homeschool scenario in their home. I was not one of those. I never had a homeschool room. I never had specific space that we were able to set aside for that. Um, So there was no just kind of having this beautiful area set up. I was not Instagramming my homeschool space, I assure you. But 
there are ways and tricks that you can use to make the environment that God has given you. Remember, God makes no mistakes. God knew he was going to call you to homeschool and he knew that you would be living in the situation that you are. So recognizing that he is sovereign, I want you to start looking at how you can make the space that God has given you work for you. That's going to give you an awful lot of contentment. That's going to give a lot of peace. That's going to help you teach your children a lot of resourcefulness, uh, perhaps, or um, you know, just really model that contentment for them. Some of the, the tips that I would share with you, actually, I shared a couple of things in the last episode about how we handled not having a homeschool space. Uh, so I encourage you to go back and listen to those. Um, I talked about some different shelving uh, situations that we used. My favorite uh, way to handle our homeschool space was through the mobile offices. So all of that is in our last podcast. You can go back and pick that up. Um, but some of the the things that I think will really, really help you as you're organizing the space that you have um, is to use binders as your friend. Um, I, I have always had a lot of binders going at the same time. Um, I have shown in a number of 365 episodes or, or videos that I've done there, I would make at the beginning of each year a very large binder for each one of my kids. It would have a divider for each of their subjects. And then I would just drop examples of their work in there throughout the year. And that actually was a system that held whether they were four years old or seniors in high school. And that allowed me to, in a very um, consolidated space, very small space, be able to show if I was ever questioned about what we were doing, how their work was coming along, what classes they were taking, and just really very clear examples of the work that we were doing in our homeschool but it didn't take up a lot of space and it gave me the freedom to throw a whole lot of stuff away. Um, whereas if you don't have a consolidated space to keep your stuff that you, you know, you really want to keep, I have never been asked one thing about our homeschool. There has never been by, thank God I was never, you know, um, having to give account to the authorities or anything like that. I homeschooled in South Carolina legally the way that we were supposed to, and I was never questioned on it. But I always, and I still in my attic, had a lot of support if I ever was questioned. And that gives you a lot of peace of mind. But I, like I noted before, I didn't have a whole lot of space. So creating a binder for each child for each year made a huge, huge difference. And that is a super easy, super inexpensive thing that you can do that will take a lot of the pressure, the paper pressure, the um, clutter pressure, all of that kind of goes away as you just start focusing on creating these binders. So that is a really, really easy thing that you can incorporate to make good use of your space, to get rid of a lot of clutter and to um, to have the peace of mind that you have the documentation and the proof of what you're doing in case you ever are questioned about it. So that's a really great way to just kind of get control of, of your situation there, um, no matter what your space looks like. Um, another thing that is really, really helpful is to set up, and this is, you know, more, really more for those with kids who aren't teenagers, obviously, but rotating toys and supplies and stuff. When you are trying to homeschool and live in the same spot, a lot of times the clutter can just overwhelm you and it becomes so much chaos that it's hard to do anything. So if you just set up a system, whatever that looks like for you, where you just rotate through different toys, different supplies, different things, um, maybe have a closet that you can put the extras up in or you know, put them up in the attic for a little while where you don't have everything out at once. Um, that was a, one of the, the 365 members talked about her system for doing that. And I thought that was a great idea um, because that will take some of the pressure off of um, the space that you're living and doing school in with, because you do have a lot of stuff. You amass a ton of stuff, but if you can put the stuff that you don't need at that moment away, it helps so, so much. Um, another of the 365 members told us about a yearly wall calendar system that she uses. And I think I've always thought these were cool. I love a good planner. I love a good calendar. I'm a sucker for it. You can ask David. Um, but she would get one of those 
full year calendars with all 12 months on it. And she would just start writing in the big things for, you know, at the very first of the year. So her kids and her, you know, were able to look ahead, see how far it was to these different things, any field trips, anything exciting. You've got it right there where you're able to see. I think she noted that she put it in her upstairs hall. Uh, so it was kind of out of the way, but everybody was able to access it. Um, it kept things on track. Uh, she talked about how they would mark off the days and kind of track to that hundredth day of school and they'd celebrate that. And um, just, she used it for a lot of different ways. Um, and I thought that was a really great idea for, again, just a very low clutter, takes up really no space idea for a very great organizational tool. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, and then another idea that's just going to bring a lot of peace um, into your, your family, and it actually saves a ton of money too, is just encouraging you to plan your meals and prep as many as you can of your meals for the week in advance. I would often have a list of lunch options. So I would make a pot of soup or, you know, a big pasta salad or whatever it was. And, um, so that was always an option or we had this, that, and the other, whatever. So I would have a, a, a number of different lunch options for the kids. And then I would more strategically plan our dinners um, because then I would know in the morning what I was going to have for dinner. So I could either start it in the crock pot or lay out the meat if it needed to defrost or know that I had until, you know, after school before I needed to start prepping. Um, that, that again, these are little things that bring an awful lot of peace into your day, which can make huge, huge impact on the way that your homeschool functions. And I promise you, you will feel the difference in doing that. I want to challenge you before I move on to the next section. Since we've been talking about organizing your homeschool space and making your environment work for you, I want to challenge you to take 30 minutes, just 30 minutes this week, set a timer, block everything else out, preferably get your kids involved. So that's like 30 minutes for you and all of them. So it's like, you know, three hours or something of time. Um, but take the time with a, with a timer to purposefully clean out clutter and organize your space. So whatever that looks like for you, it could be that your homeschool space is in great shape, but all the kids' rooms could use a little attention or your room could use a little bit of attention. Right here at the very beginning of the school year, just take 30 minutes and just see how much you can get done. I think you'll be shocked at how much traction you can get with just a 30 minute timer. Then I always found if I would start with something like that, that I, I would be much more likely over the next few days to set a 10 minute timer and do just a little bit more in somewhere. Um, and again, when you've got all of you working together, which this is a great way to help your kids understand their role in helping the house run well. So if you set a timer for 10 minutes and you have three kids, that's 40 minutes worth of work if you're working with them that you're able to get done in just 10 minutes. And anybody, even the youngest of children can stay with something for 10 minutes. So uh, I encourage you to take the time, make that first move, set a timer for 30 minutes if you can, um, and then see where that will take you. I think that just just focusing a little bit will give you a win, and a win is a great thing to um, encourage your heart and get you moving for success. So that is our uh, kind of second block of tips. The third block of tips that I want to talk to you about is about building excitement for this school year. Um, both in yourself and in your kids. I know a lot of the stuff that we would do at the first of the school year, uh, oof, was as much for me as it was for them. Um, so I have a few, I know a lot of you, probably most of you have started by the time that this podcast airs, which is fine because you're still early in the school year. So instead of saying, you know, a first day tradition or whatever, I want you to think about some early in the school year traditions that you can start this year that can be something that you guys look forward to early in the school year. For our family, it was a fall retreat. I, When I was in high school, and I, I believe I only got to do this twice because we moved around a lot, but I think twice I was able to go on a fall retreat. It was like the first full weekend of school or something like that. But it was such a good time. The teachers were all there. The administration was there. We were able to 
kind of spend some time with our new friends, get to know the teachers. They were able to to do some teaching and lay a vision for the year. And I remembered that when we started homeschooling and just thought that was such a great idea. So David and I tried to incorporate that as often as we possibly could. And we did it most years where we would just go away for a weekend, take the kids, um, you know, no technology at all. We would laugh together. We'd play games together. We'd hike, do whatever. But we would also talk about, this is a great tie-in to that first segment where I talked about the family vision and bringing your kids involved. Do that on a fall retreat if you can. Um, it just was a great time to make sure we were all on the same page. We spent time praying about the year that was to come. We talked um, about goals and stuff like that. And we did that even when the kids were really, really young. Obviously, it looks different when you're talking to a six-year-old as when you're talking to a 16, 17-year-old. But the beautiful thing about that is as a parent, God grows you along with your kids. So um, you're, you're able to jump right in wherever your kids are. So I would encourage you to create an early year tradition um, and preferably one that involves all of you guys getting away, having a great time. And it doesn't have to be where you rent a cabin and go off like we did. It could literally be you go to the woods and hike around for a day or whatever works for your family. Just setting aside that time that is special where you can talk and have great meaningful conversations and talk about the year to come. I think that has so much value and it will help you so much for the rest of the year to just get on the same page like that. Um, Another another tip in this is that I would encourage you to incorporate from the get-go time of play. You know, I've been sharing on Instagram a good bit um, the importance of play. Play is so critical for children, but I it's as critical for me as it is for my kids. Play allows us to explore what we're learning in different ways. Play allows us to um, laugh together, make memories together. Play allows us to stay in better shape. Play allows us to really deepen our relationships. And so starting right now, bookmark time for play in your day and get out there and play with them. It makes a huge difference. And so many of the memories that we have with our kids is through shared experiences, shared play times, um, times that we were able to go outside and get just sweaty and have a great time with them, whether it was, you know, playing hide and seek, jumping on the trampoline, playing four square, um, swimming in a pool, whatever it was, we were generally right there with them as much as possible. So uh, from the very beginning of this year, set time in your day that you are setting aside for play. Here's why that's so important. You know, as well as I do, that if you don't um, bookmark time for things that are really important, all of the urgent stuff will swallow it out. And you're going to get to the end of weeks and be like, oh, I didn't do anything relational with my kids. Or I feel so terrible because things were so chaotic this week or whatever. If you say, I have an essential, we are going to do stuff that is active and fun with our kids every single day. Even if it's a short amount of time, you're able to actually set that time aside. Your kids are going to see how important it is. It will give you all a breather in the stress of your day, and it's going to go a long way towards helping you to have a very successful homeschool year. One of the things that I want to remind you is there is a ton of science that shows that when a child or anyone really, when when you're active for just 20 minutes, your brain works better for hours after that. So just getting outside, getting some fresh air, some, some good sunshine, running around, you are resetting your children's brains and they will be so much better learners, so much better um, or so much more ready to actually learn and absorb what you're trying to teach them than they would be if you did not. So setting aside times to play with them is a very, very big deal. Um, the the third thing that I would I would encourage you with is to make, it, make use of your library this week. I know for most homeschoolers, this is uh, something that you do all the time. I was really, really bad at this. I always thought it was a great idea to utilize the library, but when push came to shove, we did not do it very often. And I so wish that we had. 
going to the library and I've done podcast episodes about how to navigate the libraries. I know there are some different realities at the libraries now. Um, so you may want to listen to some of those episodes, but to, to go out, make that a regular part of your routine, getting books, always having nice, good stuff around to read, things that your kids can pick up during quiet times or whatever. Um, those are great, fun outings. And um, again, as with the playtime, if you just build that into your routine early in the year, you're going to find that that sticks and it becomes much more of a rhythm of your week. And those, those, little excursions, library, play, whatever other type excursions make sense for your family. Those become um, traditions very quickly, but they also become things that your family looks forward to. They become a welcome break in the middle of, you know, cleaning up and doing school and all of the actual work part of what you're doing. These are great opportunities to, to just really lean into those relationships with your kids. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Moving on, where I'm, I'm hoping I can get through all of these. Moving on to the next, uh, where we're just going to look at organizing your plans and resources, um, really efficiently and effectively planning your year. I would encourage you, first of all, to set up weekly planning meetings. I have talked a lot. This was one of the greatest things that David did for me when I was a young homeschool mom. He knows how much I really love to be organized and I love to know what is coming. And he also knows that chaos drives me nuts. It like almost shuts me down. So when the kids were young, every Sunday night, he would allow me to just go out. I'd probably usually go to a coffee shop or something and I would take my planner and my books and I would sit there and I would look at the week ahead and I would plan it out and I would pray. Sometimes I would just sit quietly, just to be honest. But I had that time to collect myself before I went into the week of school. He took that time to just rile the kids up and get them all sweaty before bed. <laughs> but that's what dads are good for, right? Um, but he would, he took that time as a great relational time with the kids without me being there. And I had just a great, great time of making sure that I was mentally and emotionally prepared for the week ahead. I would encourage you to find some time when you're able to do planning like that. If you aren't able to go out like I was, again, David was wonderful in, in, that was his idea even wonderful in sending me out like that. But, you know, if your husband works at times when that doesn't work, or if it's just not practical for your family for a myriad of reasons, just set the time where you, you go in your room and shut the door. You uh, take a quiet time, maybe where your kids are in their rooms and they need to stay there and read a book or whatever, take a nap. Um, set aside time that is absolutely your planning time for the week. Um, I think it'll make a huge, huge difference in, um, in how you feel about your weeks as you go through them. The second thing in that uh, in that arena is I would plan breaks and little rewards for yourself and for your kids. Um, a lot of a lot of families have like a Sabbath type cycle, or uh, where they will homeschool for six weeks and take the seventh week off, or something like that. We never were able to pull off something anything quite that steady. Um, God gave us teach them diligently, as a lot of you know, not long after we started homeschooling and teach them diligently kind of took over the rhythm of our lives at that point. But we would work in a lot of days off where we would just, you know, have a home ec day or a pajama day or, you know, a go to go to the woods and have fun day. Or we would do um if, if I felt like things were getting monotonous, I had a number of unit studies and stuff set aside so that we could mix things up, do school differently for a week or so. So I would I would plan those things ahead of time. Like look, look ahead. If you see that there's going to be a particularly chaotic time, plan a break after that. Give yourself some margin. It's so important. Those, if you try to drive yourself, um, beyond what you are emotionally or physically able, you are going to get sick, most likely. Your kids may get sick. You are very much more likely to become brittle and miserable in what you're doing. And remember, heart schooling, homeschooling for the heart of your kids, missionally looking at what you're doing is 
relational at its core. And so we want to make sure that we are safeguarding those relationships. Building in time for breaks, time to do something different is really, really important uh, for that. Another thing that um, one of the, the moms shared with us was she would use sticky notes for her daily to-dos. And um, those are really great. There's uh, the She was talking about the, the they're like, a five by seven or so sticky notes, the big ones that have lines. And she would just pop those up on the refrigerator every day. She was able to see kind of in micro what she needed to do that day. She was able to tear them off and throw them away when she was done with them. So it was, it was easy, but it also didn't require her to carry around a big planner or anything like that. She was just planning in real time uh, the things that needed to get done in that day. So that was another tip that I thought was, um, was really good for just staying on top of your daily tasks uh, without um, burdening yourself with another big resource or something like that. Just little sticky notes, those medium-sized sticky notes, whatever, and and going a day at a time with just those little to-do things. And I don't know about you, but if I have a to-do list and I'm able to just start checking off things, I feel awesome. So I think that there's a lot of instant gratification in doing it that way too, which is really fun. Um, the final section that I want to share some tips on is about balancing your homeschool life. So I have shared a ton of tips with you already. I have just a few more that I want to 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 give you before we finish up. But this section is going to be all about finding a balance between your school stuff and your home life and you know your relationships and making sure that those stay in balance. This is, you know, in order of importance, this is really high. Um, but I wanted to leave you with it because I thought that, um, anyway, I thought that this would be a good way to kind of close things down. Um, this this piggybacks very well on what I talked about at the very beginning of bringing your children into your vision and your mission and your goals. Um, I would encourage you first and foremost, start your day with your kids with prayer. Um, we have a prayer series that I, I walk you through about praying for your children. Um, I will link that here. Um, if you haven't been through it, I really encourage you to do that. That will help with your morning basket, your morning routine. But then when you finally get to the point where you're all ready to start your day, make sure that you spend some time in prayer. This is a great time to um, talk about what you're grateful for, to set a... a um, to, to set a vision for the day or um, <laughs> to set the tone for the day as one of gratitude. And um, so give the kids things to, to, or time to share what they're grateful for, and then turn those into praise to the Lord through prayer. Um, talk about things that you're praying about, things that they're concerned about. By taking the time to pray with your children every day, you're going to get amazing insight into the way that they think, into what's in their heart, into things that are bothering them or that they're excited about or that they're grateful for. Um, it is a great, great thing. So you are then teaching them so much. You're discipling them, but you're also relationally investing in understanding them better, which will help you be a better teacher for them, which will help you um, even curate what they're going to do that day, that week, whatever. You're going to get a lot of insight from that. So start your day by praying together um, and actually ending the day just Anytime you can pray together with your kids is a great idea. One of the things um, that a mom shared with me recently was uh, she did what she called kitchen door prayers, which were whenever her children were um, heading out to something or even, you know, just kind of they'd been doing something and they were heading out, but she was staying put. She would take just a second and pray for them before they before they went. So as they kind of went through the kitchen door, she would take that time to pray for them. And I thought that was another really great idea um, that would that would help a lot in that. Um, as far as finding that that balance, look at how you are able to um, 
to take the time as you're doing the, the courses, especially the ones that we would call living subjects, where you are able to, to build in deep conversation time with your kids. And again, this is something that you, you may think requires an older kid to be able to do it, but I had amazing conversations with my children over history, literature, science, and so on, uh, Bible time, when they were very, very little. And those times are not just unbelievably impactful for education. Like it teaches them how to be conversant. It teaches them how to think critically. It teaches them how to express themselves. It teaches them how to be discerning. It teaches them how to read and understand what they're reading. Like I could go on and on and on about the educational benefits of starting your day with these living subjects and really uh, leaning into the conversations there. But in addition to those educational benefits, the relational benefits, the insight that you're going to get, you'll see how they think, how they learn, how they process things. You'll get to see if there's anything that maybe you want to come back and talk about more deeply with one of them. Um, it's going to be a great time. And really, you're going to build a lot of great memories that way. We still talk about the the fact that uh, when the kids were little, uh, we were studying in mystery of history and we're looking, or it was in the lesson about King Tut and Camden, my oldest, set up my older of the two daughters, so my number three child, uh, for uh, saying that uh, essentially it was who killed King Tut, which I the his advisor I killed King Tut, but Lizzie Gray, you know, I killed King Tut, and it still stays with her today. And she's married and out on her own. But if you ever ask my family who killed King Tut, it's Lizzie Gray now. So um, just fun little memories that will never ever leave your family. Um, but it's a great way to learn together. It's a great way to bring your spouse into the what you're learning as well, because then when everyone's around the table, they're going to start ex explaining the stuff and it, they generally start with what they learn together. And so just talking about what they've learned, um, laughing about the things that happened, um, you know, the, the way that somebody read something weird or whatever, it's a great relational time. So spend that time investing in relationships by doing as many classes as you can together is a really, really great day. And then finally, uh, two more things that are really kind of small. One is I would I would encourage you to have a whole lot of theme days that you're able to throw out. Uh, again, these are kind of break days in some ways. At least that's how I used them. But um, a home ec day, an art day, uh, an upside down day, uh, you know, whatever it is, just different things that you can announce on the day of, hey, we're going to have a whatever day today. Just mix things up. They infuse a little bit of excitement. Um, you're able to just lean more into relationships on days like those, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, and then also, I would encourage you to schedule in, and I've already said this, schedule in enough margin or backup days, light days, where if you fall behind at home, or if you're just weary, or if you just really feel like today, I, I just need the kids to play, and I just need to be quiet you have that flexibility and a lot of times you will come out better on the other side of it. Um, so, so work those things in. I think that they will be really, really impactful for you. Um, just remember that homeschooling is a journey and and so I'm, I wanted to give you a lot of tips for kind of starting out things to think about this year, but don't try to do all of them at once. But also recognize that if you are trying to sprint, do everything that you can, you know, everything at once, go as fast as you can, you're going to flame out a lot quicker. Find your mission, recognize that going for the hearts of your children is what is sustainable and what is so impactful and what will help them do better academically, relationally, socially, emotionally, spiritually, all of the ways. So focus primarily on their hearts and those relationships and everything else will follow. Build in that flexibility, but have enough structure to what you're doing that it orders your days. It, it removes that chaos. We talk so much about that in Heart School. Um, and so I just want you to, to really think about things in those ways. Um, I would encourage you, again, if you're not a member of Teach Them Diligently 365, join us there. I 
cannot overstate the impact that it will have on your family if you do. We have great conversations about stuff like this regularly. We have meetups throughout the month where you can physically talk with others. We have get-togethers. We have retreats. We have two retreats coming up this fall, two in the spring. Um, It is just a great way for accountability and encouragement and staying on task together. So I will give you a link to 365 in the show notes as well. Join us there. It is an investment in your homeschool that I promise you will never, ever regret making. Um, So I hope that this has been helpful for you. I would be very, very grateful if you would subscribe to our podcast, if you'd leave us a review or a rating. Um, It just helps us reach so many more people. Um, We're trying very hard to, to make sure that everything that we bring you is stuff that we believe will be helpful. David and I have homeschooled for a long time. We have discipled four kids Uh, who are now three of whom are are grown. One is a senior in high school, but God has been very, very good. We try to bring in great guests as well. So subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss a single week. Um, And I just, I'm so looking forward to seeing you around social media, seeing you in 365, seeing you at our events, um, and just hearing how God is working in your families this year. I hope that you have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to talking to you again real soon.